My name is Brenda Kaler and I lead our nonprofit client engagement efforts here at Armanino. Today I'm speaking with Grant Ballard, the Chief Science Officer at Point Blue Conservation Science. So Grant, I know Point Blue has been doing conservation and restoration work for a long time. How have you seen the broader conversation about climate change evolve over the time you've been doing this work? That's a, you know, it's been a, I've been working with the organization for almost 30 years now and things have changed so much. It's hard to even know where to start, but really over the past 10 years or so, uh, we've been really focusing on climate change as a major initiative. And um, 10 years ago, we had to work really hard to get climate change on the agenda for anyone. Uh, regulatory agencies and other organizations were not really wanting to talk about it. And especially, uh, they weren't really ready to talk about what we call climate adaptation. Um, there has been a willingness for a little bit longer, maybe the past maybe five years, to talk about mitigation or reducing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere or reducing emissions. But the idea of adaptation, that we were gonna to have to deal with climate change now and into the future, definitely has not been uh, very politically acceptable to talk about, but that's starting to change now. So that's, I'd say a big, big difference because the reality is we do have decades of change um, that's already underway that we're gonna have to adapt to. Um, so, you know, in the, in, during our lifetimes, we're not going to be stopping climate change or reversing it, uh, not entirely anyway. Hopefully we can slow things down, um, but there is more of an acknowledgement now that climate change is actually happening. Um, maybe the sort of gateway to understanding of climate change is through sea level rise, uh, because there's really good data on sea level rise going back 100 years. And long-term data sets like that can really put things in perspective. So people can look at the data and realize, and, some, and, and for some people who live near the coast, they've actually seen it in their own lifetimes. Um, so you know, and then when you realize that that's happening and that uh, along with that, uh, storms are getting bigger and more frequent and there's more and more disasters to deal with, uh, the idea of something like building a seawall to try to keep the ocean out um, you know, it might seem like a good idea at first, but uh, we're, we're recognizing that that's just a short-term solution in the scale of things. So um, there's more of an appetite for what we call nature-based solutions, where we look for things that are more resilient, that will actually adapt to the changes that are happening. And these can be anything like mangroves or salt marshes or even uh, dunes on beaches. Uh, can can really um, they're basically softer and more adaptable. They'll they'll actually evolve as uh, the climate changes. And um, we're also seeing things you know basically people's reality in places like in San Francisco where I live. The temperatures are getting to the point where they're hot enough that um, everyone's wondering why they don't have air conditioning all of a sudden and. There's never been a need for air conditioning in San Francisco before. So um, the, these changes are happening right now and people are looking for solutions. Like, you know, in San Francisco, there's more interest in planting trees than there ever was before for more shade. So um, I think these, these changes and lots of others are becoming more and more apparent to people in their daily lives. And uh, that's leading to opportunities to make real change. Yeah, I've definitely seen a lot of this, you know, myself, I've lived in, in San Francisco only for the last 20 years, and I have definitely found myself wishing for an AC unit more often in the last few um, than, than ever before. Um, so it's a, it's a great perspective to share, you know, that it really is a long term, you know, issue that it's not something we're going to change overnight. Um, for the folks listening, how can they support your cause as part of their daily life? Well, um, I'm always one to make a shameless plug for just you know, donating. Um, we're definitely open to that as a nonprofit organization. About half of our money comes from um, individuals and philanthropy. Um, and the other half of our money comes from um, agencies, government contracts, and uh, 
uh, those sorts of awards. Um, we also do have uh, the opportunity to volunteer on some of our projects. And you can find out more about that on our website at pointblue.org. Um, we also just encourage people to um, you know, read the summaries of our publications and white papers like also available from our website and get involved in stuff that interests you. Be an advocate for science, be curious, you know, model an evidence-based approach. I think we're in a time now where um, for those of you who are interested in science, this is a, a great time to engage in conservation science. Um, couldn't be more important. And I really um, am heartened by the amount of uh, interest that we've gotten over the past year during the pandemic people who have been spending more times in their backyards and wondering and having more curiosity about uh, the natural phenomenon that they're observing as they have that time to spend. So um, lots of ways to get involved. Uh, please just, you know, start at our website and uh, we can point you in the right direction. And what's that website again, Grant? It's pointblue.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about today. Um, thanks for joining us today, Grant, and everyone stay tuned for future episodes containing more nonprofit insights from Arminino experts and clients.